Welcome back, crew. Uh, we're doing another Meet the Maker. Uh, and this time we've got Yochai with us, uh, the creator of Karen. Uh, and, and guys, uh, if you watch my actual plays, I'm actually saying it right. So uh, we, we've been right all along. Uh, and uh, we've got him here to kind of talk about uh, Karen 2E, uh, as well as just some other kind of experience in the TTRPG industry. And shout out. So thank you for joining us, Yochai. Uh, thanks. You do you do say the game name correctly, although my name is pronounced not cha like a uh, cheese, but uh, like a German ah sound like yochai. It's totally fine, by the way. I apologize, but I always say no, 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 it's fine. Like... <laughs> I wouldn't even have mentioned it except you mentioned correct for correctly pronouncing the word Karen. Which first off, I mean, what do I know? It's just how I say it, but I'm sure it's pronounced in a much more interesting way in the UK. But um, thanks for having me. And yeah, thanks for joining us. Is Karen actually a word? Yeah, it's a stack of rocks. You've never seen a Karen like in a forest or something? Or wow, in a, there's a new word trail? today. <laughs> really? No. It's also like there's the Karen Terrier. There's a city of Karens in Australia. Which, but um, yeah, a Karen is, you know, you see them at least in the East Coast. Uh, you'll go to like a forest trail and there will just be these stacks of rocks. And historically they were used for burial but they're also used as waypoints um which is kind of more what i was inspired by is oh these you know if you stack rocks as a way of telling people what is in what direction you know that feels kind of on brand for the kind of play i wanted so that's why i picked the name but yeah it's a real it's a real thing <laughs> well i'm one for three i learned how to pronounce it right uh but did not know it was a real word yeah, it's, <laughs> it's okay it's all good well, thanks again for joining us. Uh, and kind of speaking of Karen, uh, you guys are killing it right now. Um, I think you're what three times or four times over goal for uh, the Kickstarter. Um, yeah, I'm not a mathemographer. We're at we're at one sixty ish as of this recording, and our original stretch, our original um goal was sixty thousand on Kickstarter for Karen Second Edition. Probably should be clear about that. Uh, yeah, so we're we're definitely doing well. I mean, some folks might say oh you you know you should have put it low higher than that and not funded so quickly but we we just tried to be realistic about what we needed to make in order to make at least some of the box sets and and to do that you have to print a certain amount of copies so we figured out how many copies one might need to purchase um uh, to get a good deal basically from these printers and uh, 60,000 made sense to us, but then after um, we funded in one hour, we started adding more stretch goals, which we had planned out potential stretch goals. We didn't actually have tight numbers behind them. We had to adjust it a few times, but <clears throat> there was always a plan to put in um, back the box set, at least one player's guide, the warden's guide, an adventure, and a GM screen. Oh, and a tear-off character sheet thing. Um, but we also thought, hey, you know, it's likely we'll get a printed anthology as well. So let's try to weigh the box for three extra adventures from folks in the old school uh, scene. And so we, we figured out what the cost of that would be. And that's how we determined our 60,000 is we tried to plan for, for everything. Uh, we also had this stretch goal, multiple stretch goals, where we would just add another copy of the player's guide to the box. Um Again, this is at no additional cost to people who backed. They're just getting extra stuff on top of what they backed. But we figured out, you know, if we maximize this whole thing and put in four additional books, how much would that cost? And 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 so far, we've hit all of those stretch goals. We have not hit the printed anthology yet. We've hit the PDF version of the anthology, which is awesome. Um, I think we'll hit the printed one probably over the weekend, uh, is my guess, because it's only at 175. And... Uh, and then after that, it's yeah, all the digital stuff, like uh, an app and translations and stuff. But um, yeah, so that that's <laughs> it is going very well. Thank you. It's going great, and yeah, because the first hour was crazy because I was at work. I, I come to my office. I alternate between working at home and the office, and I was at the office that day. Got the email like an hour and a half, like. After it was sent, I'm like, oh, sweet, it's already up. I'm like, oh, it's already funded. Uh, so that, that was crazy to see. So I'm glad you guys are kicking that off well. And I'm super excited for the, both the printed anthology, but the app, too. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. Because uh, especially for uh, when I play Karen a lot, I usually play a lot of pickup games, too, with people like uh, just trying to do a one shot and like 
either if uh, one of our, our main campaign canceled or if people are just like uh, around on a Friday and we want to jump jump on. So I think that'll be so much easier for people to kind of go through it. And people like apps for building their characters nowadays, I feel like. Yeah, and I mean, one thing about the app, and I can kind of go into that, but you can use it in person as well. Oh. I, it's very mobile friendly. So when I I ran a a, a game last Friday, and it was in person, but it was with seven people, and I only brought six copies of the player's guide because I didn't think there'd be seven people. And uh, one of the players was a friend of mine who's one of my longtime players, and um, he just pulled the app out because he already had an account, and he just played it. You know, he was able to play the whole thing right from there. So you can even play it when you don't have all of your tools. It, 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 at the moment, it doesn't have built-in dice rolling. That is a that is a plan in the future but of course you can just get an app to to roll dice you can even just type in roll a d20 on google and it will roll a d20 but my point is you could theoretically with this app play karen in person without any of your stuff uh you know you could play it fully digitally if you needed to but i, I did build it with the intention of playing online um since i i do both i play online um, which started basically during the pandemic for obvious reasons, but I also play in person quite frequently. Um, and what I have found is that although there are um, Cairn-ish modules for things like Roll20, for Foundry, um, which I actually uh, maintained the Foundry system for Cairn for quite a while, um, those things would either be incomplete or break um and e even if they do exist they would need to be updated for karen 2e not because of the rules but because backgrounds have such a major presence in karen second edition so last year i started working with a co-worker of mine on developing an app basically like what kind of app would i want to use you know you who plays online what would i want so i built something that is going to be free it's going to be open source it's going to run on, uh, I'm going to host it for people who can play on my own server, but people can download it. And if they know what they're doing, they can set it up on their own servers uh, pretty, pretty cheaply. But the idea is you'll be able to log in. You see a um, character generator. Or you, see, well, you see a list of all your characters first that you've already generated. And then you can click new character and there's all these um, options for generating a character. You can roll and just not even think about it and get a portrait and, all of your bonds and your starting gear and everything just done for you and, and you're just done. Or you can roll one at a time or you can roll one at a time and then click roll the rest and they'll roll the rest and you have as much control as you want um, and you can create custom backgrounds, whatever you want. But once your character is made, you can then edit the character, change how many uses, uh, you know, how many uses of rations you have left or how many charges of some, you know, magical item do you have left. But also you can create containers like a cart that you can pull with your hands or a horse that can hold things. So you can actually transfer items from your main inventory to the horse or to the cart or whatever back and forth. Um, and it works very seamlessly. You can also add your character to a party so that other people can see your character from within this party and even share inventory. There's also um, a public version of every character sheet that you can share out if you just want to show off the character sheet. Uh, that's the current feature set. I'm sure I'm missing something. We do plan on adding built-in dice rolling as well as some cool GM-specific stuff like um, the warden might want to roll on the dungeon events table, which is a new thing in Karen's second edition, or they might want to roll on the wilderness events table, or they might want to um, roll for a random monster or a random trip, whatever. So we're going to build that into sort of the warden's view, um, but for the most part, it is fully functional right now and and um, I've been playtesting it. Uh, it's been really great. It's so much better than what I've used in the past. Now, it doesn't have built-in mapping, but that's not the point of it. You can use this along with Alba Rodeo, or my preference is Schmeppy. It's what I use, which people haven't really heard of, but it's kind of a digital wet erase mat. Um, it's a really, really fast way of making and using um, maps online, and it has a built-in dice rolling functionality as well. So I, I planned on using these two apps together, or literally you could just use my app with, um, you know, like Google Jamboard or, or Miro or something. You don't really need to pay for any app um, to have a good game of Karen online. The name of the app, by the way, which I have not told anyone, is Kettlerite. That's what it's called. It's called Kettlerite. It's named after one of the backgrounds in the Karen Second Edition Player's Guide. It's kind of like a tinker of sorts. Um, so yeah, so 
that's the app. Um, I'm glad you're asking about it because people, I mean, people have been supportive, but I don't think it's been high on their list. Um, I really want to hit that stretch goal, which is 200K because I've spent a lot of money building it. So I really want to, to get that paid back. But once it's, once it's paid for, I just want to put it out there and I'll, you know, it's, I'll make it free and, and I'll open source it. Um, and I have a bunch of other features I might want to add in the future. And I'm sure folks will have ideas and opinions about what I should add, but um, it's pretty feature, or uh, feature, feature proof, feature full. It's pretty full featured at the moment. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about it. Thanks for asking about it. Yeah, it's a really cool thing because especially with a lot of the games I've played, like, the one shots and like one of my favorite spots, like for uh, for Karen and the OSR games, and just kind of seeing what type of random character you kind of roll up there and see yes. all the different personality yes. and background mm-hmm. traits. Uh, so I think having like kind of doing that and having to be able to either roll them all, like you said, or even just go still go one through one, but have it like documented so you have to do like the writing portion of it. Yeah, would be so nice because I hate doing like even typing portion of it. Uh, so it's just nice <laughs> to kind of do that, have everything there, and just kind of hit the table while you're done. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a, uh, it's exactly yeah. as you describe, um, and you also can, you know, of course, add notes and change stuff if you want, and make your own custom backgrounds. Uh, it's interesting because there's little things that I didn't consider when I was building it. Like for instance, there's one background that you roll where you start with a creature that lives in your stomach that it takes up one slot, and it just wants you to take it home, and it will like injure you to get you to do what it wants but on the other hand it will keep you from dying because it wants to keep itself alive so it kind of tells you things that you need to know and that's all cool all you know that's well and good what i didn't realize is i had to figure out a way to like make it take up a slot of inventory when it when you first roll it but then also make it clear that it's not really an item you know so i had to think about how that would work like you can't transfer it to your cart, right? So, like, I had to think, like, okay, how do I make this immutable and stuff like that? Like, it's it's amazing how much game design actually goes into developing these apps, and I appreciate how complicated it is, and and I really like it when people tell me, hey, I built this thing for Karen. It's all so like, I you know, I want people to still keep doing that. And what I hope by open sourcing the app is that people will see it and go, yeah, you know what? This doesn't. Let's make this better. Let's let's make let's 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 bake this in a little more and make it more natural. I still want it to be usable by others. And, and honestly, folks can just fork it. It'll be on GitHub. They'll be able to fork it and make their own, you know, let's make a, a different into the odd hack. Like, or maybe maybe someone will build a Mythic Bastion Land version of it or something. Um, that would be really cool. But uh, my hope is that people see it for what it is, which is a, like, uh, desktop and mobile first, clean, fast, free tool for running care and characters uh, online or in person. That's really cool that you've got the in-person piece too. I was kind of the same story. I used to, I used to run at a game store every week until the pandemic hit. Now I think I'm mo- I'm mo- sadly mostly online. I, like I love my online games. I feel like a cool community of people, but I miss being in person more often and rolling. Yeah, games, so. yeah, for sure. And I, I, I can see it. Like what I can see is people having like a tablet set up with like the party screen, and then you know when someone has a question, you just flip it around, tap it, go. You mean this, and it's all right there. So it, it is it is meant to be usable by both. Um, it was always intended for mobile at the same time as desktop. Because that was the other big problem I had is I, there were some apps that were okay. Like Foundry is, is pretty good um, and it's heavy and it breaks every time they update it. But Or I should say my module would break every time they updated it. But um, it's not good for mobile. Uh, so when I had, I had friends who would be like working, they'd be like going to work to play because it's quiet at their work but they didn't want to use their work computer so they would join using their phone which is actually fine um but then the app would not really work there and that was a problem so i was trying to accommodate folks who just wanted to play from wherever they are and, and that's hopefully what this does that's a great point i've had one of my friends that uh, one of my players actually had some internet issues or was trying to use his phone for foundry and like uh, he first, first it overheated his phone but he really couldn't yes. get much on there yes yeah, this yeah, I mean it's it's pretty um I'll pull it up here. I didn't actually have it ready, but I'll um you know it it's it's pretty I don't know if you how well you can see this here, but it, it does work on mobile and has you know you can see your stuff, you can edit it, whatever, but um yeah, the, the idea is for it just to just to work wherever you need it. 
And one thing I should have mentioned this too. So for anybody watching, I'm going to have the Kickstarter link down in the uh, in the comments on that side. So check it out. Uh, I'm going to post this up today too. So uh, oh, wow. there's what. <laughs> 14 days left still for the Kickstarter? Something like that. Yeah, less than 20. Less than 20, but yeah. So definitely go check it out and go get the box set. Yeah, it helped push it closer to the 200,000. I'm pretty, I got the box set for myself. Uh, usually I cheap out on those ones for the box set, but it was very inexpensive. So I was happy to be able to get the box yeah, set. Yeah, at least, yeah. Well, the one issue we had was that we had a really hard time finding shipping fulfillment partners outside the U.S., um, many of them would require a certain amount, like, oh, you have to guarantee 300 copies, you know, something like that, um, which, for example, in Canada is just not been a thing. Like, Canadians have not, there have not been 300 Canadians who said they're going to buy a box set, right? Um, Americans, yes, like, we have many thousands of backers, and the UK as well, and, and in the EU as well. But I'm happy to say that for the UK and the EU, at the very least, we have found partners to bring the price down for shipping originally it was like the box set was inexpensive but it was as much to ship it you know which was a big problem and a lot of people in the eu and the uk said i, I just can't pay the same for shipping as the box set that's crazy um and so we tried really hard we were able to find two different fulfillment partners who now are um they brought they've about, they've i think like halved the cost so it used to be 50 dollars for shipping now it's like 25 and people are willing to pay that so we've seen people just upgrade their um uh, what is it called? Their pledge. Yeah, <laughs> we've seen people upgrade their pledge to um, say, "Yeah, I want it shipped now." Unfortunately, that has yet to happen for Canada. We're trying. All the Canadian storefronts have just gone out. I mean, there's kind of one left, but they don't do fulfillment anymore, which is really a shame because it's so close. Like I could drive it across the border. It it's it sucks. Like I I really wish I could help Canadians get there. And Australians are just screwed. There's just no. It's, just, it's unfortunate, but we in the U.S. at least are fortunate enough to, yeah, you can buy it for 55 bucks and the shipping is like 13 or something. It's it's or less, uh, which is awesome. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I do think it's inexpensive. We, we tried to look at what other box sets were doing and we're not trying to undercut them. We just we wanted to add more value to it. So, for instance, the player's guides, we're, we're selling those at cost because all of this stuff, like the Warden's Guide and the Player's Guide, are both going to be free to download like as soon as they're done, right? You're going to be able to download them for free, and that's always going to be true. The Player's Guide will be print on demand and will be available much sooner online. I think maybe when the Kickstarter is done, I'll just pop it on Amazon and Lulu and stuff so folks can just grab the Player's Guide. Um, the Warden's Guide is not finished yet. I'm about 80% done, but when I'm done with it, I'll find a place to put that as well. I might make it a little above... Um, cost you'll still be able to download it for free as a pdf but i might make it a little little above cost in that case uh mostly to justify my um lavish spending on rpg products but uh but yeah so that's that's always been the goal so now when you buy the box set you're actually getting a bunch of extra copies of the player's guide in the box set at no extra cost and the idea is that you you can open the box and go here's one for you here's one for you here's one for you here's the app whatever and that will facilitate play which has always been my goal is just to to make a product that is both rules light and robust but facilitates play for new players and veterans alike which i know i'm sure that a lot of products say that um and try to do that i hope mine is successful um at least i think it's successful but you know time will tell I think even one E was successful. I was looking through. I was trying to rack my brain, but I'm pretty sure one uh, K and one E was the first um, OSR game I played, uh, and most of that really? was due to it being free and having its own right. uh, monster or bestiary uh, online right. for free as well, just to make it easier to kind of go through and build all yeah. that. Right. Yeah, and it's. I think that's that's you're right. That's the reason it gained popularity at all is because it took really good ideas that other people had. I put one or two of my own possibly good ideas on top of them, and then I just made it for free. And I also made it hackable, so people felt like, oh, I don't like it, I'll just change it. Um, and then I did a lot of work on conversions of existing modules, but also on the bestiary. I mean, the bestiary has, you know, whatever, now I cut it down. It's like 150 monsters or something. You can go and get a copy of the bestiary at cost right now from Lulu. And Amazon, for some reason, is making me go through some hoops, but um, it'll be on there again soon. But the, the bestiary, which, you know, I have it... Um, 
actually. It's too far away. But anyways, <laughs> it's in my bag over there. But the best array is this, this, this little book, and um, you can also get it online. But I do think that, that that is my goal. My goal is to make it accessible. And uh, that's also why I tried my best to get it translated into, I think it's like 13 languages now, which is pretty awesome, uh, which we're going to do something similar with the Karen box set. I mean, it, that costs money for something as intense as this. So the all the ladder stretch goals are all um, getting it translated. I mean, honestly, even if we don't hit those stretch goals, I will work to get them translated. I, I do speak a few languages and can kind of do some of that myself. But what I do want is to be able to pay someone to do that work so I don't have to. Um, but yeah, the, the, the Karen community is mostly built around that sort of facilitating rules like OSR play. Um, now, there is a question like, you know, if you did that already, why did you make a second edition? Um, people always make second editions. And the truth is that the first edition wasn't really what I wanted. And, and I and you can see, I said this really early on in, in interviews with me, you can find um, on like Daiku games and stuff. I said what I always wanted was to have a um, rules light knave slash into the odd style system with um, electric fashion land styled felt careers, meaning that when you roll up a character, you have all these starting gear and background entries that are tied into that character that make your character more interesting and tie them to the world. And I just didn't have the, I think, design chops at the time to really make that a thing, but I, I always wanted it. So I kind of, in my mind, released a sort of incomplete product um, with the original Karen because it was lacking this these kind of backgrounds, which not everyone likes, but I do. So really it was for me. Um, so I actually started writing those almost immediately after the first Karen came out. I started writing these backgrounds and you could find them on the website um, in the kind of secret work in progress section for years. Uh, and then over time, folks asked a lot of the same questions over and over and over again. So I wanted to clarify some of the rules. So I just rewrote how the rules are worded. I added a couple minor, minor um, uh, mechanics, uh, like, you know, they they were already kind of there in my own games, but I didn't really make them extant in the rules. So things like petty. So now when an item doesn't matter, when it doesn't impact your inventory, it's just called petty. You don't need to worry about stacking it, which is what I used to do. You just if an item doesn't matter, if you have if you have a feather in your cap, it's petty. Don't worry about it. You can write it down in the petty items character sheet section, whatever. Um, so I added little tiny things like that, and then I also added some procedures uh, like dungeon crawling and and wilderness exploration, because I didn't have a uh, an official way of doing those things. I had my own ways of doing those things, but people kept asking. These are all optional. They're all at the end of the book. They are things you can totally nix if you don't want it. If you are used to Karen's first edition, you'll still be able to buy it. I'm not going to get rid of that. Um, the Karen's second edition player's guide has all the rules that you need. They're 99% the same as they are in first edition. They just are a little clearer, and there's a ton of art. That's really the big thing. The Warden's Guide is a whole different story. That's like world building, warden advice, um, making your own backgrounds, uh, you know, creating monsters, a lot of stuff that people just had questions about that are literally not in the first edition. There's nothing, there's no advice on, well, there is advice on converting monsters, but it's like a higher paragraph, you know? Um, I took a lot of stuff that's on the website and I, put it together in a usable fashion in the warden's guide. So now there are systems for um, how to create a dungeon. You know, there's a bunch of procedures out there for writing dungeons. Very few of them tell you how to stock rooms, for instance. They'll just say, um, you know, roll on some table and put a monster in there. That's, that's not really, to me, as satisfying as creating a sort of thematic, coherent dungeon that has monsters that you would imagine in there you know maybe there don't need to be harpies in this sci-fi futuristic dungeon you know like you want to make it thematically coherent and you also want to make the rooms and hallways create player choice and and, and endeavor um to give them as much agency as possible so so i designed a system that i think will help people create a dungeon they still have to do the work but a lot of the dice rolls and a lot of the procedures and principles that I included in the dungeon generation, I think people will find useful. And I did the same thing for generating a setting and the same thing for generating a forest. I'm excited for that. Cause I just said like a lot of like those, like the, the game master's guides and like other, just even in other books, it's usually just gives you like a couple dice tables and tells you just to roll on it and throw these things in there. 
which makes it easier as a game master. But a lot of times, yeah, you've got like all over their themes. Like it'll be like this deep, dark dungeon and you've got this weird fey creature in there for some odd reason. So uh, it'll be cool that they kind of see how you kind of build in those themes and kind of build in some of those mechanics to, to make it easier for wardens and game masters to kind of go through and right. build out their dungeons easy. And I made it like for the dungeon, for example, I wrote an example dungeon that I generated using my own system. And nice. so you can see what I what I rolled and how I wrote it. And I, I use a very specific formatting style, which, you know, there's no there's no like universal formatting style. But um, you can see the way that I write in. Uh, I released a free dungeon as kind of like a promotional thing for the Kickstarter called Rise of the Blood Olms, which is um, you can get it on my itch and on drive through. Um, and it's a free dungeon for Karen Second Edition. You can download and play right now with the Karen Player's Guide. And it is written in the exact style um, that I wrote the dungeon example in. And that's because I used my own procedure to write this published dungeon. And um, I don't have, I didn't like record my, well, actually I did record my initial roles, but I didn't record, record the room by room roles. But um, you, it's, 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 I literally wrote a dungeon and then sort of reverse engineered it to see what would make sense to people who aren't me. And then I turned that into a mechanized system with tables. And then I wrote an example dungeon out of that. So you can kind of see how it works. And, you know, I didn't, I don't hold your hand. I say, you need to think of the thing, but you know, if you roll on a table and you get um, uh, a room that has a trap in it and that trap has um uh, uh, is associated with a piece of furniture. That's one result and is activated by lifting it. Like those are two things. I now know, okay, this room has a trap in it and it has to do with furniture that gets triggered by lifting the furniture. So what can I think of? Well, does a door count as furniture? Maybe a chest. Okay. So a chest, you open the chest or you, you pick it up or maybe, maybe like when you, well, maybe it's like a, a, a diamond skull that looks like a piece of treasure, but when you lift it up, um, uh, it triggers something. And maybe the skull is the shape of a chair and that's why it's a piece of furniture. I'm just making stuff up right now. But the point is I kind of go through this process of connecting these seemingly arbitrary things using spark tables, which are a uh, Chris McDowell invention that I really love. Um, maybe he didn't invent them, but he popularized them. Anyhow, you build these scenes for each room and then you can see how I... Um, created the room elements from these random roles and then you try to do the same thing for yourself so hopefully this will help people i have put screenshots of some of this online if folks are looking for examples and uh, all backers will receive you know earlier versions of this before it's finished so uh probably in the next month or so is my guess nice i'm looking forward to playing around with that and especially with kind of like that design work how did you get into kind of like designing ttrpgs like you you clearly put a lot of thought and kind of like care into that. Like, what kind of brought you into that side of the gameplay? Well, I started playing role playing games in the 90s. I played Palladium Fantasy Second Edition, which I found at a used bookstore right next to where my mother worked. And, uh, uh, I, you know, I fell in love with it from the beginning. And I, I never wanted to be a player, I always wanted to be, you know, a GM type. I'm just, I think that's pretty typical where you just feel yourself, you know, kind of gravitating towards it. Um, and then, I took a long break. Um, I got back into it when my brother-in-law uh, was hit by a car. He's fine now, but he had broken his leg and he um, he was laid up for many months. And I, I knew he liked Pathfinder and I had kind of like been out of the world, but I knew I knew 3.5 and I knew what had existed after it. And so I said, hey, you know, 5th edition just came out. I'll, I'll buy the DMG and I'll, I'll learn it so I can run games for you while your leg is hoisted in the air. Um, so I did that, and then I started playing it a lot, um, like twice a week. This is before I had kids. Uh, so I would play it twice a week or so with um, an in-person group, and that was really great. Um, and then I was in a game shop, and I discovered um, Avery Alder's The Quiet Year uh, in this game shop in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And um, it just kind of like opened up my brain to another world, and... I went from there to finding Dungeon World and other kind of story games-ish sorts of things. And then like so many, I went from Dungeon World to playing um, old school games. And uh, I liked some elements of that system, but there was a lot that just left me feeling dissatisfied and I couldn't really wrap my head around it. Like why, you know, I like certain elements here, you know, putting the fiction first and feeling forward and, and some of that, but I really didn't like other aspects. And and just my dissatisfaction with Dungeon World is what led me to start designing my own 
games. First, I designed Powered by the Apocalypse games. I mean, I, I did work on a number of them, um, uh, mostly hacks of Dungeon World, but I also worked on some minimal D6 hacks and um, eventually found my way over to old school play. Didn't start hacking, just started playing because it was very different. Um, so I started playing other games. Like I think I started with um, <clears throat> what is now Old School Essentials, which is uh, was called um, VX Essentials at the time. Yeah. And I played a number of those kinds of games. I played Vieja Escuela, which is this like Spanish OSR game. I played um, uh, eventually somehow. I Oh, yeah, I played Knave and Maze Rats and then found my way to Into the Odd. And that's where I really felt like I remember running it the first time I ran the the built-in adventure of the Iron Coral for the original version of the Odd that came out in 2014. And it just sort of like, it was that same feeling as as what happened when I discovered uh, The Quiet Year and Dungeon World. It just sort of opened up my brain in a different way. And I remember thinking like, wow, this is for me. I found what I want. You know, there's still a lot to learn. So I asked a lot of them questions and such. And then after playing to the Odd a lot and doing my thing of where I like, you know, when I was in the Dungeon World, world i i was kind of a well-known creator there and so i put together a syllabus of all the dungeon world content out there and it was really great for new players to have a big list of all the stuff they need to read when they when they start playing dungeon world i did the same thing for into the odd which eventually um brought me to the attention of other kind of creators who thought that was useful and and um we, i became friendly with them and then eventually kind of peers because i would start to say hey you know it would be cool like, what if um, Into the Odd, but, you know, had magic? Or what if Into the Odd, um, but in space or whatever? And I started looking at these different systems that were both already out there, but also iterated my own. Um, I started reading a lot of old school adventures and converting them to run in Into the Odd, and then later converting them to run Into the Odd, uh, to the, Into the Dungeon Revived, um, which is a great open source hack of Into the Odd for uh, fantasy role-playing. It predates Cairn. It's also open source. It's also... Um, you know, for many people, I think it actually fits the D and D bill better than Karen. Um, why it's not more successful, I don't know. I, 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 I'm Vlad, who makes it, is still making it. Um, uh, he's a wonderful creator, great artist. Um, really, really, uh, a lot of respect for him. Um, but the one skill I do have, and I think this is what made Karen send out, is I'm really good at community management. I'm just good at building community, whatever that means. That's that's my one ability. So I did that. I, I started building up my own Discord server called, the, you know, the NSR Cauldron. It's called now New School Revolution. Um, this is in late 2019 or so. I, I kind of made my personal Discord server public, and I started kind of um, promoting a, a new sort of ethos within the old school revival, um, namely one of old school spirit, but different rules than what you're used to like maybe not so compatible with with old old games like like D&D second edition or whatever or OD&D &D, whatever you're playing those games are fairly compatible in some ways the games i liked whether it was um into the odd or or maze rats or mothership whatever those games were not compatible with old school rules but were compatible with the play style which is what i fell in love with so i I, I kind of promoted this community that was built around those ideas, but also um, is very openly political in some senses, um, very uh, pro-inclusive, particularly around people who aren't just like cis white dudes. And that is, you know, that is the dominant thing in this scene. It's like cis white dudes. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, but there's just a lot of that. And there's a lot of privilege that comes with that. So my um, kind of... Uh, my efforts were to try to change the way we talked about um, the scene and, and old school games in a way that um, was more inclusive. And, you know, it's easy to just say that, but it, it, it was like, I, for instance, would not allow folks to link to people that I thought were transphobes or, or who said racist shit in the past or who supported um Donald Trump openly, whatever. It's the people that I, you know, so it was openly political. And this this ruffled a lot of people's feathers. Even folks who might have tacitly agreed with me, they thought, you know, keep politics out of my games. And I don't think it's, that's a thing. I think I think politics are just any politics you don't agree with. Like, you know, it's if you're having, you know, everyone at their own table has their own sort of um, 
rules about what's okay or what's not. You know, like for instance, I don't allow sexual violence in my games because that's not interesting or fun or like a good idea to do in games. So it's just not part of my experience. Um, so, so that's a political choice I'm making, right? And I, I sort of promoted that idea. Um, got a lot of hate from it. Some like anti-Semitic stuff was a little disheartening, but for the most part, it did draw folks who were looking for something similar, something that was less. The old school is only retro clones that are compatible with D and you know, and, and also folks who were looking for a space where they could create games and create adventures without feeling like they were getting questioned about why their characters had pronouns, in the, you know, in their play and whatever. So, um, and honestly, I don't see our server as we don't like discuss politics there. We just try to keep it on our sleeve. Like, no, we're not pretending that um, there are no such thing as politics in gaming. So that, yeah, so those two things kind of came together. Um, people say, you know, is there such a thing as NSR games? To me, an, an NSR game is any game that's made out of the NSR cauldron or any game that calls itself an NSR game. I don't really um, care. I consider myself an OSR guy to this day. You know, the NSR is just a sub-genre of current old school play. I mean, what even is old school, you know, at this point? We, I know what I like. You know, I like games that favor exploration. I like games that favor problem solving. I like games that favor rulings over rules, that flavor player, that favor player skills over um, character skills, all these kind of archetypes of OSR play that people always bandy about. That's what I care about. I don't care about rules compatibility with um, every TSR module from the 80s and, and late 70s. Like it, that doesn't matter to me. I don't think, I honestly don't think it matters, period. I think you can run those modules with any system that has um, that play style in mind when it's being designed. And I, I think Karen proves that. I do it all the time. I run you know, what is ostensibly uh, a, a TSR D&D module from the early 80s. I can run it with Karen and it runs fine. So, to, I mean, yeah, I have to do conversions, but the play style is the same. And that's what's important to me. It doesn't mean you can't or shouldn't play other games like Old Swiss Gentles. It's great. You know, um, uh, games like basic fantasy role-playing and uh, uh, um, Beyond the Wall, those are amazing systems that I love. They're a little too crunchy for me, which is saying something. Um, I'm not like a math guy, so I would prefer not to have modifiers in my game. I like games like the Black Hack, you know. So long story short, um, I got into design by figuring out what I like and by figuring out the kind of community that I that I like. And I, I'm privileged to um, not take things personally. I have a pretty thick skin. Um, I will argue forever, but it's more of a fun thing. It's not out of um, personal emotional response. So I, I can survive on the internet. You know, I, I do survive on the internet. And I think if you, if you have a hard time with that, don't be part of it. Don't just don't just be, have your own world. Yeah. And, and so that's my advice to people. It's like, no tweet is worth it. You know, it's not, if it gets your ire going, don't do it. It's not worth it. I definitely feel you on that one. Yeah, if you're going to be putting yourself out there, you do have to have a little bit of a thicker skin. Because uh, yeah, people will disagree with you on uh, things you're like, I think that was controversial at all, but uh, right, let's yeah. talk about it, I guess. Well, yeah, you, and you put your face out there so you have someone like, you know, people can see you and go, this guy looks like this or whatever, which I didn't, it's funny, when I, when I started putting my face on my profile pic, which I hadn't done for years, I'd always use this XKCD comic for 20 years or whatever. And I changed it to be my face at some point. I can't remember why. Um, and I remember seeing this guy refer to my, uh, rat like physiog, physiogen. I can't say the word physiogen me. It's like a outdated, like race science thing. This is this oh. anti-Semite. And, um, and I thought, wow, like, do I look like a rat? I don't think that's true. I was just like, I just don't think that's true. I, I, you know, if anything, like a Jewish rat, but I don't really, you know, so I, I had no, I remember being confused by that, but yeah, you do get people when you put your face out there, literally attacking your physical characteristics which had never has never been a thing for me before it's just i'm lucky that people just other than my you know siblings people don't really make fun of how i look so i i was i wasn't so i'm saying i you, you know you're braver than me putting your videos out there you know on a regular basis lucky knock on wood youtube's been pretty nice to me i, I stay off twitter i have a twitter i tried to do twitter for a while i hate twitter uh so i really don't yeah. do anything with I, it anymore. I, I, yeah <laughs> i literally go on there once a week i have a scheduled tweet that you know, I have a weekly podcast, so yeah. I once a week I, I say, "Hey, this is this episode is out." I think when the Kickstarter is done, I might just close my Twitter account. It's just no, I don't use it. You know, so like, what? 
it's a garbage place. I'm now on Blue Sky, which is like okay, but it's got some of the same problems as Twitter. I think we're moving towards kind of private servers, anyways, which is a, a shame, honestly, because there's public stuff that's fun and interesting, and we're losing that. You know, we've been doing these um, Ask Me Anything's on the NSR Cauldron, and they're only there. So if the server goes down, you lost those AMAs. So this one user has been taking the interviews with the person's permission and making them viewable on our, we have a, 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 a web facing forum that I pay for host, maintain, whatever. Nobody uses it, but it's, it's out there. If you go to discourse.rpgcauldron.com, we have a forum and um, it's the same kind of community mindset as the NSR cauldron, which is a discord server, but it's publicly accessible. You can find it on Google and you can find these AMAs as well. So this person is doing some real, real good work doing that, which I appreciate it because that's the kind of stuff I used to have to do, you know, and that, that's when you know a community is successful is when you don't have to do the community building anymore. Uh, that's great. And uh, and I, I kind of say the same thing. I think it is getting more to like Discord to kind of those closed servers. Like I, I, I've joined a ton of them myself and like, uh, and it's, yeah, it's hard to it's hard to read. Like if you get one tweet, that's all like a topic and you get like six ads yeah. or six like random it's, things. <laughs> oh, it's so bad now. It's, it used to be bad, but yeah. like there was gems. Now it's just bad. There's no gems. Now it's, it's just, even if they remove the ads, it would still be bad, but the ads and the like way that it has changed since Musk took over is just objectively worse. And um, I, I do want to see it burn. Twitter, I, for a while, I tried to like keep a Twitter presence, and I'm like, I just don't enjoy this at all. So yeah. I, I'm just, I yeah. think I've been on there like three months, but uh, I may deactivate yeah. it eventually. But I'm stepping just around <laughs> that. So one of the other big questions, and you kind of mentioned a couple of the ones that you're playing. So like, I know Karen's probably like, what you're playing, kind of what you're focusing on right now. But what other like tabletop RPGs are like in your rotation when you're like you're not like dedicated to Karen? Yeah, well, the last couple of years has been very Karen focused for obvious mm -hmm. reasons. Um, but that doesn't mean I haven't played other games. Um, I really like the Twenty Four XX series of games by Jason Tachi. Um, he's a friend of mine um, who uh, does uh, really thoughtful and smart design. Um, the Twenty Four XX stuff is all open source but or you know it's creative commons license just like karen but basically it's a framework for running really rules light games and he wrote a bunch of games as have others there's like hundreds of hacks of this now but just the 24 xx series that he wrote has like i don't know it has a lot of zip files but it's there's a lot of games in there and um there's one that they made for run that he has that jason has made for running mothership style adventures um called um uh what am I, I just sorry this is me being tired it's called um orbital decay and it's you know it has like a little stress system and it has um very mothership feeling kind of character archetypes and and very simple rules um especially if you come from the pbta story games world and it's just you know a thin little pamphlet that has some tables on it that you can just take and and run um a, a mothership pamphlet or adventure with and, and I, I really like it it's it's really great um, I also really like all the Nate Treme stuff, like Tunnel Goons is really awesome. I ran a bunch of Tunnel Goons, super minimal rules light stuff, but interesting, you know, it does different stuff than other games. Um, the same for his other stuff, like Pilgrim's Misfortune. Is an, it's actually a Karen hack where you roll uh, against your worst traits instead of your best traits. Um, so it's kind of an interesting idea. And um, uh, I do occasionally like story games as well. I have um, lots of solo stuff that I run, like like a lot of solo stuff, um, not solo role playing. I actually don't understand that, but more um, like just solo card and dungeon games that um, are more like strategy games. I really like that stuff. Um, I have a whole whole bunch right over there, but um, uh, yeah. So that's kind of what I often am doing. I'll also occasionally jump in, you know, a random like Nave or OSC game if people invite me. Um, uh, oh, and of course, Into the Odd. I, I, I'm really, Mythic Bastion Land is really awesome. It's so cool. And Chris is yet again blown it out of the park. Um, is that the right? Is it blown? No, blown it out of the water? Whatever the. Blown out, yeah, blown it out of the water. Not, it it took me a minute to. <laughs> I'm like, that sounds right. That sounds Yeah. <laughs> There's the Pope shit in the woods. You know, it's one of those like, mixed metaphors. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, again, mostly rules light. And, and of course, the Black Hack, which I'm a huge fan of. Um, 
Yeah, I guess that's kind of it. But I do, I do stay in the into the odd sphere these days. Um, it's just oh, and Mouse Ritter, Isaac Williams. Mouse I like Ritter, Mouse Ritter. Which, um, yeah, Mouse Ritter is great. I got a kid um, who likes it a lot, and you know, I know it's not just for kids, but they like the mice. You know, um, we also play. He and I play. Um, I wrote a game called the Dungeon Game, which is a um, children's dungeon crawler basically like it's not really role playing it's pure dungeon crawl it's like it's like children's hero quest sort of um it's free you can get off my itch but um he he likes it because he builds out this dungeon with these wooden cubes and then he nice. picks a character and and he he goes through it and it, there's no gm you you know you play together and you can see all the monsters in advance you just have to kill them um he likes that a lot so we'll play that uh so yeah i guess that counts as sort of a role-playing game more of a dungeon crawler that's cool. And a lot of the ones you mentioned too, like, uh, so I, I like Miles Ritter, uh, and I was looking through my Kickstarter before, like, uh, our, our conversation, uh, and you mentioned like three of them that are on their Kickstarter, well, outside of yours. So Karen is one of them on there, but like, I got a lot of OSR right now on my Kickstarter. Okay, I've got Mythic Bastion Land. I haven't had a chance to check out the PDF that released for that. Did you back uh, Dolanwood? Uh, I didn't. I didn't back Dolanwood. I I was it's, late on that one. Uh, Nave is the other yeah. one. Uh, Nave Tui, I should say. Oh, Nave Tui. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep, I oh. backed that as well. Um, I backed that, and I added the. Even though I have my own prints of mouse of maze rats, I really wanted one of his prints of maze rats with the uh, really nice art. <laughs> um, I I backed that. I backed Dolma Wood. I'm a big fan of Dolma Wood. That's kind of what inspired Karen in the first place. Um, if you like the kind of aesthetic of Karen, it's different in second edition because I have my own setting. But um, uh, you Dolma Wood is. I mean, there's just so much playable content there. I've heard a lot of. Good, I missed the Kickstarter on that one, uh, but I've heard the good things. It's probably what I'm going to pick you'll up once it's out. Yeah, yeah, you'll have a chance. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I was like, it's going to be like an OSR year. I feel like I, I think Mythic Bastion Land's be shipping soon, uh, and then they. Yeah, like he's uh, the PDF is like basically done, and as far as yeah. I understand, it should be on its way um, on time. So, yeah, and Chris is real good at Kickstarters. I mean, I have, yeah, I have all of his stuff right there. Um, another thing. I, I there's a lot of really great um settings and stuff out there that are um you know currently available um ultraviolet grasslands for instance is by uh, Luca Reyes is really good and um all the the books by um Andrew Kolb uh the the Neverland which is like for Peter Pan ish and Oz and the upcoming Alice are like inexpensive beautiful they are ostensibly for fifth edition, but they are 100% OSR inspired and, um, in my mind, uh, are should be considered like OSR products. They are they're built with the same ethos in mind, and they're beautiful and and again inexpensive. So strongly recommend. I have the I have them both right here, and you can get these online right nice. now. You know, it's 25 bucks um, for really beautiful books. Um, and there's also like. Um, a lot of stuff here but <laughs> i would also recommend a lot of the good like lulu has a lot of good inexpensive osr stuff um one just came out by hexanome called uh uh under the house of the moon dial he also did um uh the sepulcher of the seven which is a really great adventure and so there's just like really cheap and um high quality stuff you can get print on demand these days um either from lulu or drive through that i strongly recommend another one i really like is um Black Apple Brew, which is at cost from Lulu, which is for basic fantasy and has conversions on the Karen website. Um, also, Black uh, Black Worm of, or I should say, the Black Worm of Brandonsford by Chan Studenek is a really great adventure that is free. Um, there's no POD option, but it is it is actually no, there is a POD option, but either way, it's super cheap. Um, highly recommended. Has Karen conversions as well. There's just so much good stuff out there that you don't have to kickstart. You can get right now. You know. That's what they have liked lately, the print on demand stuff. Cause I always love having hard copies for things. So I'm mm, glad that more are kind of going that way. Cause for a while, it's probably like everybody was just doing PDFs. Uh, yeah. So I'm glad that like, there's yeah. more print on demands so and get those uh, kind of printed out. Yeah. I often will go and just have my local printer print stuff or have Lulu print stuff because if it's a PDF only, like there's good stuff out there that's just sitting there as a PDF. So I'll go and, and create a special book out of it. Like here's my print copy of Layer of the Lamb, which you can't get as POD, but. You know, I, it cost me $3 off Lulu, Lulu to, to upload it and do it myself. And of course that requires like knowledge of that stuff, but I, I, yeah, print your stuff if, if it makes it easier for you. I, I, I can't really, my mind doesn't like 
save the information if it's not on paper for some reason. I don't know what that is. And I read a module a week, so I have to print it out, you know. S same. Like, I got like for enjoyment. Like, I like love having like the, the print and just kind of going through it, kind of leisurely reading it. Uh, I always have to have my laptop open to put my notes in, or I'll forget. I'll forget if I don't put notes whenever I'm doing a review. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, it's just nice. I to write. Have that I have a. Copy. I have an index card I write in. And then when I'm done reading the book, because I read it over, you know, I read when I review books or modules, I read them usually over a few days. And so I'll keep as a bookmark an index card and then I'll take that index card and then I'll put it into a Google Doc. Um, so I'm similar. I do have to put it all in digital, but it actually really helps me to write it after I've written it. Like I write it once and then when I put it all together, I kind of clarifies what I think about it, you know, um, and yeah, anyhow. But yeah. Oh, there another Kickstarter we didn't mention is I did have my own adventure last year, Beyond the Pale. That was on Kickstarter. Um, and it's written for Karen. It's actually technically the first, I guess you'd call it first party adventure for Karen. It, 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 it hasn't shipped yet, but the books are on their way to our fulfillment center and I've, I've seen them. They are awesome. Well, they're actually, they made it to the fulfillment center. Now they're on their way to the U S but the point is it's a beautiful little book that, um, I haven't physically seen, I've seen pictures, but I'm really excited about, um, and you can, technically still buy it you know on the lost pages website so if folks are interested in um weird jewish settings that are osr um first in principle uh check out beyond the pale i'm very excited about finally having it if anybody watching i'll throw that link down there in the, uh, the, the description too so definitely go check that out thanks perfect so with that kind of wrapping up a little bit but uh what else for anybody that hasn't heard of Karen or is that even like kind of the OSR scene, like what, what would be kind of your selling pitch to kind of get them to check out Karen, especially the Kickstarter, but like even in just OSR in general too. Right. Well, I mean, first off, you can read the current Karen and the Karen second edition players guide for free right now. You can get links to both off of the Karen RPG.com website. You can also peruse the various hacks and adventures and, um, all that sort of thing. There's a lot of that out there uh, on the website and on itch and drive through. Um, the main selling pitch for old school play is that it, um, it focuses on what happens at the table more than what happens on your character sheet or what is supposed to be happening in the rules. The rules are there to um, basically help you decide how certain events should, should transpire. And yes, that's true for every RPG, but the focus of the rules is to enable players to use their minds to solve problems and hopefully their characters will survive and they'll get a sense of <laughs> enjoyment out of that, but also to create a sort of emergent narrative where you don't pre-plan your adventure in an OSR game. You don't, you might have an adventure, but it, the way that it adventure is written is it doesn't tell you what, what will happen, what, what abs you know there's no real railroading it's it's more here's a setting here's a, a dungeon whatever you have the, leave it to the players to make decisions about what their characters do and less um telling them how their characters should feel or telling the players um what they should do in a given situation so you you try to emphasize the players agency as much as possible to um Give them the feeling that this world is alive. So, for instance, you wouldn't prepare a plot; you'd prepare a situation. You would, you wouldn't think, okay, the king is doing all this stuff, and then when this happens, this other thing is going to happen, and when that thing happens, this is going to—that's not what happens. You say, "There's a king. These are his goals. These are his advisors. These are their goals. They're trying to get this stuff done. The players are over here. Here's one or five things that they might want to do." Now let's just play and see what happens. And you let the players make their own decisions. They might not want to go to the place where that king is. And if that's what happens, then that's what happens. And realistically, the agendas of those uh, other factions will come to pass and the world might turn to darkness or whatever, but at least the players chose to allow that to happen instead of it just happening no matter what the players did or um, be only because the players interacted or whatever. Um, and if the players say, hey, I want to explore this little uh, sand dune in the north part of the land, 
Well, so instead of writing a whole dungeon for that sand dune, you would um, uh, get just a couple ideas in mind. And hopefully by the time the players got there, because they'd have to travel there and they'd go through these random events that occurred on the way and, and there'd be these procedures that helped enable that style of play. Once they got there, hopefully there would be enough natural kind of emergent narrative where you knew exactly what was going to happen when they got there. So you, you really just sketch out a brief sort of um, framework of play and then you let the characters just in that sandbox and the players feel like the choices they make are their own choices like like it's not like you have three doors and no matter what door the pcs open the same result happens no a different result is going to happen in each and you don't know what's going to happen yourself like you're just as surprised running a game as they are with what happens and in many ways it's similar to story games you know you play to find out but unlike many story games you don't emphasize the um characters as the most important things in the in the game world they are not they are usually <clears throat> they're usually very low level or low ranking or irrelevant to the world that they're in at least for a while and their um interactions with npcs and the world itself are not preordained and they might even be irrelevant to the rest of the world you know so you you try to create this real feeling of freedom and agency in play and you do that by underlying every decision with um, a, a risk and a danger by openly telling the characters what the risks might be so that they might be able to make decisions using all available knowledge instead of depending on a dice roll that determines how much they know about a given situation how much they perceive like perception checks are not very popular in the osr right like in fifth edition or in dungeon world you roll to find out what you determine about something what you what you can see what your character notices that is not a thing in the osr in the osr you tell the players what they see given their abilities to see here know something about it about a situation and then that gives the players the tools to be able to make decisions with full agency or at least as much as they could possibly hope for so that's i guess the gist of it it's sort of hard to explain in one sitting like this but um the idea is do it yourself hack the rules so that they make sense to you make decisions about how things should happen using conversation and dice rolls not over you are using preordained mechanics that determine how much damage you take when you fall 50 feet versus 100 feet or um what you know uh you don't see a lot of mechanized role playing in in old school games. People just talk and play it out, and you don't. You sometimes will roll for charisma or willpower, or whatever, in certain situations when there's risk involved. But generally speaking, you let the players role play. You don't mechanize those mechanics, um, and not everyone wants that. And so people say, "I don't, I don't understand." Like, you know, how am I supposed to do X, Y, and Z? And my character sheet doesn't say what happens when this happens. Yeah, you yeah. figure it out as you go. You talk as a table and you figure out, you know, that I, I, there's not as much rules lawyering, lawyering, lawyering. There's not as much rules lawyering in the OSR because there's not as many rules. You know, the, the, the play is what happens between the rules. It's not as a result of the rules. It's the rules are there to have consistent agreements between everyone as to what should happen. But a lot of the times what happens is a natural emergent flow of the narrative and um, you know, you keep these principles in mind and you run adventures or write your own adventures that help instill this sense of play while also changing the rules that you don't care about. Because, hey, you know, at my house, this is the this is the home rule that we do. This is how it works. And and that's the OSR. I mean, I, I feel like I'm doing a poor job explaining it, but that's my best uh Quick oh, you kind of hit a lot of my favorite pieces of it too and well, one of the big things i'll say for gms like if you want to kind of have a game that's easy to teach people like osrs are great like especially if you have either people that are new to rpgs or just even people you want to kind of break out of like their usual pathfinder 5e and uh all like the other molds they're, they're great for that because you can teach them like an 
10 minutes, have him roll up a character, another 10 minutes, and he can get right into the adventure. Uh, especially if you, like, you know, I mentioned, if you want to have him think out of the box, like OSRs are perfect for that because most things will usually kill him if they just try to straight up run and fight him. This is kind of a right. good way to kind of get him thinking creatively right. because, like, there's, their sheet won't be able to win for them. Right, right. And I think I remember my first time playing Maze Rats, the, the insane workaround that the players figured out to get around this one problem. They had like, a Rube Goldberg machine, basically. And in an OSR game, you would just say, okay, that works. You wouldn't even roll in some sense. You'd say that that's, that's smart. I'm going to just give that to you, you know? And I think you can do all that stuff in others, you know, play styles and scenes like fifth edition, but <clears throat> the truth is fifth edition doesn't really have dungeon crawling mechanics and, and procedures. And it doesn't really give you advice around that sort of thing. And in fact, it, I would say that the, not the rules themselves, but the play style and culture around fifth edition tends to emphasize character centric play because think about it. You spend hours building a character, you know, you spend a lot of time with a game like Karen or Nave or into the odd character creation. Once you know how to do it, it takes like five minutes, you know, I, I mean, literally rolling for each thing and you get this sort of randomly generated character, which is another aspect of OSR play is you play with what you're given as opposed to like metagaming and min-maxing and figuring out the best possible build. Like there's no point in emphasizing that if your character's just going to die. So you, you, you try to hope that it, you'll survive and play smart. Combat is war. It's not smart. It's not a uh, sport. You know, it's not balanced. The characters don't go against a, a, uh, a CR rating or whatever in fifth edition in, in old school games. No, if they come up, up if a bunch of, you know, beginning pl uh, player characters go up in a dungeon against some major dragon, they're going to die. You don't balance it. You, you, you give them ways to solve their problems and work around. So maybe instead of fighting the dragon, they have to talk to it, but you don't, um, uh, care about balance. You you let the players figure it out for themselves. You also have things like uh, reaction rolls. So maybe that dragon is going to be in a good mood when they get there. You know, it, it adds some randomness. And you also have things like um, in a traditional old school game. If you're specifically if you're if you're doing a dungeon crawl, um, the Ways that player characters interact with the world around them are, I'm not going to say they're constantly afraid of everything, but there is a sense of caution and danger that comes with playing with weaker characters that are in an unbalanced world. That fifth edition, it just gets thrown to the wind. You know, you're, you're probably, you, yes, you can have TPK, but it does. It is a lot harder, I think, than it is. In, I mean, in, in Karen, you can die in a single combat the first time you go in there, you know, and because of that danger, you try to avoid combat, which means you use critical thinking and that's not for everyone. Some people like combat and, and, and it's not that I don't like it. I love combat. It happens in every, almost every game I play, but it happens when it, it's like the least possible, um, it's the least, uh, <laughs> favored result, or it's the best possible solution because whatever reason, maybe they're, the, the player characters are overpowered or something in this one case. Um, so that's a big part of it for me is, is, is the randomness and the critical thinking and the lethality and, and all those things. And um, I do think it lends itself to a more open ended play. Uh, anything can happen and um, anything is possible. And there's just a lot of um, design principles that go into old school systems and modules that you just don't see in other scenes. I mean, uh, there are way more fifth edition products. And in my opinion, they're mostly garbage compared to even the, you know, uh, most unpopular old school product. Like they're just the, the overall um, production quality design, both in terms of layout and also um, the way things are written. I just think that the OSR is fundamentally a, a, a better scene to be in if you're looking for quality experiences that you're not writing yourself because it saves you that time. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I don't know how else to kind of explain it, but the OSR is a fun place to be a lot of free stuff, inexpensive stuff. Um, definitely worth your time to check out. And it's really great for folks who just, you know, don't need to spend an hour and a half in combat every time they play 
a game. And that's how it was for fifth edition for me. It was combat took forever. People were on their phones, you know, because first I have to roll to hit, then I have to roll for damage. Then I have to figure out, um, you know, uh, all these like little bonuses. And I just, I mean, into the odd doesn't even have to hit rolls. You just do damage, you know? So it's the same for Karen. And um, I think that that makes a huge difference. Definitely. And GMs like for that too, like, the prep work is significantly less for an OSR game. Like you could come up with an adventure while your peer players are rolling their characters. I did that one of the streams. I'm like, I'm not sure exactly what we're doing yet, but you guys roll up characters, and I'll figure something out. Uh, so it, it, it's great for that. Um, one last thing I'll ask to just um, before we wrap it up, uh, especially with the Kickstarter still going, uh, and then with that, what? would be like the what, what's your favorite thing that's kind of included in the bundle uh with uh kind of the the, the box of that side i know we've got like a lot of cool stretch goals a lot of cool things that are already in there like what's the thing like you're most proud of i mean the player's guide is my th the thing i'm most proud of because i spent so much time writing it and testing it again and again and again and again <laughs> um and i really like how all the art turned out i love my collaborators you know um this time i'm not doing it alone i have um, uh, a, 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 a core team, an editor and a layout guy, um, that's Derek and Adam. And th although they, they do have their own respective roles and are very good at those things, they're also just folks I bounce ideas off of. You know, I'll say, hey, does this make sense to you? What do you think about this? And then I'll get an earful, you know, and they'll they'll give me their opinions. And so it is much more of a collaborative um, uh, approach. Uh, I, you know, they're getting percentages of the Kickstarter. Uh, I paid for all the art out of pocket, but when it came to the Kickstarter, they were just as important to it. So they're each getting, you know, 10% because they they really did make a huge impact over the last year or so. Um, meanwhile, uh, I really love all the artists. You know, we've got um, uh, Bruno Prosecco did all the cover art. So for the Player's Guide, Warden's Guide, and the box set, that's all his art. He's an incredible Brazilian artist who I've wanted to work with for years. Um, Kenny Wajaja is another one. He did um, the player background art. Um, Amanda Lee Frank, who's one of my favorite artists and designers. She's also like an incredible writer and um, adventure designer. Her her adventure, um, Vampire Cruise, and You Got a Job in the Bar Garbage Barge are some of my favorite uh, old school adventures. People should check them out. Um, she did a bunch of the art for the Player's Guide and the Warden's Guide, and it's just perfect. And finally, the bestiary art by um, uh, Roque Romero, who's a Spanish artist. He He... And I did work together in some of my earlier published adventures for uh, Electric Bastion Land. And um, uh, he just did a really amazing job at the bestiary art. I mean, he's he's rolling out this stuff constantly. Um, it looks so good. S such cool interpretations of these, you know, my version of these classic monsters. And, and then finally, of course, um, uh, Francesco Zanieri, uh, also known as Lee Copeo. He's an Italian artist. He did the original Karen character sheet, which is um, really great. And he also did two character sheets for uh, Karen's second edition. So just really gr happy to be able to like pay these artists. I love to do stuff that I love. Like how amazing is that? Um, and so I'm really, that's the part I'm most proud of is just what went into the players and wardens guide to make all that happen. Um, and then second to that is the anthology probably, um, which is three separate adventures. Um, one by Amanda P who did Tannic, which is one of my like favorite Karen adventures. Um, uh, as well as my friend Brad Kerr, who's my co-host. Um, he's best known for Hideous Daylight and um, uh, Wyvern Songs, which are like, you know, platinum bestsellers on drive through um, for both Old School Essentials and Karen. Um, and then finally, uh, Zedek Shu, who's um, my all-time favorite writer in the OSR right now. Um, he just, everything he does is gold. He did like Reach of the Roach God and A Thousand Thousand Islands. Um, he's just incredible, incredible incredible Malaysian writer who um, uh, is doing the final adventure, which we just hit. So hopefully those will all show up in a print version if we get to 175K in the next couple of days here. And um, so, yeah, I'm really proud of, of that. And then I'm proud of the app too, because it's for me, you know, it does what I want it to do. And that's, that's all this has really ever been about is, is I wanted something for myself and it just so happens other people like it. Hooray. I'm excited for the app. I'm also excited for me and uh, one of my buddies, Doomer, on my server. The 
they're excited for the dread hospitality adventure they got um announced um, that's, um, that one sounds I mean, pretty you mean, sick. yeah um yep uh i won't say more but yeah you sh- they should be excited they should be excited um that's and oh i didn't mention this before but like i did write i actually wrote t- three adventures for the box set um i took two of them and they ended up becoming um the included adventure that's in the box set there is like I think I forgot about this earlier. There is an included adventure, not related to the anthology, but a first party adventure I wrote that's set in the setting for Karen, which is called Fold. Um, the adventure is called Trouble in Twin Lakes, and it is um, illustrated by uh, Wuggy, who's a Finnish illustrator who I really love. He did the art for um, Rise of the Blood Olms, my my other adventure. Um, really great artist with great range. Uh, so I, I, I'm really excited about that. It's It's a solid adventure. It's got a bunch of things going on in it. Um, I'm very curious to see how people play that. So um, I'm really, yeah, I feel like I completely forgot about that. But I, I just because I, I, I wrote it basically last year, and it's just been sort of sitting there finished for a long time. And I'm just like, ah. But it has really great art and maps and layout, and and I think it's a cool, weird. It's a setting with a dungeon, but it, it's a setting, and it's got all these locations you can go to, and it's super weird. Um, so. There's like some sci-fi stuff happening in there. You'll see. But yeah, so I'm really proud of that too. So I guess I'm proud of all my children. <laughs> bad, bad answer. Well, perfect. Well, for everybody, remember there's a descri- uh, the link into the description for the Kickstarter. Go check it out. Uh, there should be 13 or 14 days of the time this gets posted. So definitely check it out. Subscribe. Uh, definitely push us to that 200,000 mark because I really want to get that. So, uh, yeah, do it. Yeah, do it for do it for T. Because <laughs> I love apps. Uh, it makes my life yeah. easier as a GM. <laughs> uh, awesome. I, didn't, I didn't know there was a foundry module though, but I have to check that out. <laughs> there is, there is, and I, you know, I it's funny. I didn't write it. Um, this guy uh, S M Cabrera wrote it, and then he stopped working on it, so I took it over. So I actually have been fixing aspects of it myself which is like i'm not great at javascript i'm more of a back-end guy and i i i every time there is a major foundry release it 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 breaks the module for karen and i'm like oh my god and i just don't want to so if anyone out there wants to take it over please it's on github um you can actually see a version of it in play i did an actual play um a couple years ago with karen on um nate treme's barrow of the elf king which is a great adventure you can see the gm view and it, it's cool. So if you want to see what the Karen Foundry thing looks like, I, I still run Foundry, but it's just like so heavy and breaks my shit. So I just, that's what, that's literally, I was like so sick of it. I was like, all right, I'm just going to, I'm going to, you know, <laughs> write my own damn thing. Well, I, I'm excited to check that out. Uh, definitely, yeah. Everybody, make sure to go check out the Kickstarter. Uh, and yeah, there'll be links down for everything that we discussed uh, in the, the descriptions too. Uh, but yo, know, I thank you again for coming on. And as I, as I said, Karen was my first OSR style game, uh, and it kind of opened up to a new genre. So uh, I appreciate that. I was happy we could get you on the the shout out to E coming out. Thank you so much, and I'm glad that um, my game could bring more people into the hobby. That's that's always been my goal. You know, besides making a thing for myself. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you well thanks again for joining us definitely everybody check that out uh until next time everybody <laughs>